I'm really thrilled to be invited today to moderate this panel, bringing together some real trailblazing women and their insights on tech trends, innovations and ideas forming the future. As the world recovers from the, the global pandemic, how is tech really transforming our world for the better? And how can female leaders in the industry use the technology to rebuild the world that works for everyone? Uh, despite the growing demand of tech roles in the UK, there's still a large gender gap with tech companies and investment raised by female founders. Whilst 50% of workers in the UK labour market on the whole are women, in tech it's half of that, 25%. And only 3% of VC funding went to all female teams, while all male teams were 68% of VC funding. So we'll get into that a little bit later. And here today, I'm joined by three incredible women. I'm really great, grateful to be here with you all. Um, we have Natalie Black, Her Majesty's Trade Commissioner for the Asia Pacific region, Tuche, who is the founder and CEO of Street Bees, and Rose, who is the CEO and founder of Street Hits TV. But before we start, I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is Sam Evans and I'm the head of International for Tech Nation. We are the leading growth platform for UK um, founders, leaders, scaling companies, uh, helping them with coaching content and community to help them scale. Over the past 10 years, we've worked with more than 3,000 UK scale-ups, including 29% of UK unicorns, such as Revolut, Tra TransferWise or Wise, and Darktrace. We also enable the brightest and best tech talent to come to the UK and work from around the world with our digital technology and global visa. So please get in touch with us if you are looking to work in the UK. Tech Nation's international team is relatively new. I joined to help build out the team to support more founders as we see them growing internationally. And we're working with the Department for International Trade and the Department for Digital Culture and Media and Sport as part of the Digital Trade Network initiative, which is led by Natalie, to de-risk and accelerate the growth of UK tech scale-ups in the Asia Pacific region. We focus on three key things for UK scale-ups, which is overseas customers, capital and talent. In the last six months, we've supported more than 120 companies scaling into this region specifically, including Seed Legals, Immersive Labs and Circular, who've already seen success in the region. We're about to launch our new programmes next week, uh, which will cover different activities across Singapore, Australia, Japan and South Korea. So I'm really excited for everything to be happening. So now to our panellists. Um, I'd really love each of you to introduce yourselves and give us a bit of an understanding of your journey and what your companies or your roles are. And I'm going to begin with uh, Natalie Black, a Magistrate Commissioner for Asia Pacific. So Natalie, I'll hand over to you to give us an introduction. Hi Sam, it's really lovely to speak to you from Singapore and I'm so delighted to be on this panel. I'm a big fan of Accelerate Her. I've had the pleasure of uh, working with you guys for quite a few years now, um, but to be on a panel with such other interesting women, to be honest, I'm going to try and not say very much because I want to hear what these guys are going to say. Um, but to explain a little bit about my role, so I'm responsible for UK trade and investment across Asia Pacific. So that's Northeast Asia, Japan, Korea and Taiwan, Southeast Asia and Australia and New Zealand. And I've had a real big push on technology. Um, we all know how incredible the UK tech story is, but one of the things that struck me here when I started this job was actually how little was known about UK tech. So our job is to push the UK tech sector in this part of the region, help you guys identify investment partners. I know um, the others on the panel have some interesting stories uh, about that already, um, to help you expand your businesses in this part of the world. And of course, navigate one as some of those tricky situations that of course can come up in any international expansion. So thanks very much for including me today and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Natalie. And Rose, it'd be great to hear from you. Hi, how are you? So I'm Rose Holst from Screen Hits TV. Um, I am the founder and CEO. Um, most people are learning about the company now and what we basically have created is a platform that lets people integrate all their streaming services. So from Netflix, to Amazon to Disney, um, stars into one. And it just helps for discovery and getting the best use out of all the platforms. And it's, it's a really interesting time. And there's not a lot of females um, kind of leading these big transitions in the entertainment industry. And so I do find myself sometimes um, kind of going up all these behemoths, you know, like the big Amazons and the Apples. 
tools, but there is a need for it. And, you know, we've been in the, the business or the industry since 2012, creating technology for the entertainment industry, um, working um, on developing aggregators for like Turner Broadcasting, for example, and IMG. And so when, you know, everything happened and there was a lot of streaming services that were coming to the market, um, you know, Disney Plus, HBO Max will be here in a few years. We really saw our technology as a way to address some of these big issues on fragmentation and the overwhelming um, frustration customers are feeling with all the content and where do you go, how do you get it? So I'm just really excited um, to be playing in this this field and and you know setting some trends um, with the new future of television. Amazing, we can't wait to hear more about that Rose later on. And Tuche, I pronounced that wrong, I know I have. But I'll no, have no, that, that was perfect. So this is Tuche speaking. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Street Peace. Street Peace is a London-based company. We now have offices in New York, Switzerland, and France as well. And what we do is we are a deep tech business. So we use machine learning algorithms to be able to decode human behavior. So we can understand and explain why people do what they do. That can be about your consumption behavior or shopping. So we have customers like PNGs, Unilever's, PepsiCo's, IKEA's, but that can also be about your reactions towards vaccination. For example, we work with organizations like NHS or you know mayor's office to understand why would people resist to vaccination. So basically, the whole idea is to bring technology to the service of humanity to understand our unconscious drivers, desires, and what makes us behave in a way that we behave every day. Really interesting. I'm going to stay with you, T, because we are here to talk about tech innovation. Uh, so you'll probably have a grasp of what's happening at the moment and what the consumers are looking at. Um, so have you, have you seen any cool new trends around technology and maybe COVID-19 or what, what are you seeing at the moment, the biggest trends? Yeah, absolutely. So I think COVID gave a lot of uh, interesting challenges. It threw a lot of interesting challenges to the tech community to focus on. And I think that has been an incredible development stage um, for some of the more nascent uh, technologies. Just to give you guys an idea, last year in 2020, in the middle of a pandemic, we grew about 110% year on year from revenues perspective, because all of a sudden there was such a deep need to be able to understand how humans react to an event that took them completely by surprise and it actually threatens their existence, right? And that, that's, a, that's obviously you know, a very dramatic stage in, in human history, but also a big challenge for technology. One of the key things we saw in the last year increasingly is that we used to focus a lot more on automation of simple tasks, right? A lot of the technological developments were about, OK, so this task is being done, you know, multiple times. Like, can we actually bring in people to automate that? Last year, that started changing towards more complex tasks. Mm. One that everyone is familiar with is obviously autonomous vehicles, right? And self-driving cars. But that's a very popular, well-known example where we are trying to actually get a machine perform a highly complex function. Another example I'll give you guys, which is not necessarily makes the headlines, it's just in the background, we don't talk much about, is strategic innovation. We always thought that coming up with strategic innovation, growth opportunities would be a task for humans, right? It's highly skilled, you can't automate. What we are now seeing with the deep technology with the computation power we have with the new types of chips with the new types of you know hardware also coming to picture we can actually automate significantly more complex jobs and to me that's absolutely fascinating because we continue to move humans into a higher and higher level of contribution in the in the cycle right so if we can for example get the data analysis of their plate if we can get the ability to detect where growth opportunities are off their plate, then they can more and more focus on the creative side, the storytelling side, communication side of things, which is which is a big trend we've been seeing in the AI space. That's really fascinating. And, and Natalie, I believe that there's, I think I read something like 80 million new 
internet users in Southeast Asia alone during the pandemic. Maybe my numbers are a little bit off, but something like that. Uh, you might know better than I do. Uh, have you seen anything that's maybe different over in Asia than we're seeing in the, in the UK? Well, Sam, you're not far off, actually. Um, and in terms of total internet users across Southeast Asia now, we're looking at about 310 million. Um, and what's interesting is how quickly that's actually ramped up during uh, COVID. So we were due to hit that number in about five years time. Um, and actually, we've hit it this year because of everything that we've seen. And of course, we're only too familiar with. So in terms of things that we're seeing that are different here, I think it's probably the pace that's really hit home. Um, so edtech, medtech, fintech, uh, you know, those were probably the top areas to look at a year ago, two years ago anyway. Um, but because of the pandemic, demand has just gone absolutely through the roof. But what's interesting about here is you've also got that combined with a big step up in investment opportunities. So there is a lot more cash in the ecosystem and the this, uh, investors are incredibly active trying to find the best way to get into those sectors in particular. So I, I think that's actually really good news for startups, particularly in the UK, because I think it means that you can be quite choosy about who you work with. Um, but also you can look at the overall package, right? As we all know, it's not just about the cash, but it's about the mentoring opportunities, the market access opportunities. And so through the digital um, trade network, and apologies, I'm going to do a little uh, pitch for this here now, but this is exactly what we're trying to do. We're trying to support the UK tech ecosystem to navigate Asia Pacific and help answer these kinds of questions. So if you, of course, yes, internet users a great statistic in terms of identifying how um, the opportunity has changed here and what we're um, hoping to do is provide a little bit of extra intelligence around how you make smart choices particularly when you're working at pace and a scale up right and you're just so incredibly busy and there are so many leads to pursue how do you make the best possible decisions for your company because of course we want to see the next stage of unicorns back in the UK that have expanded through the opportunities here in Asia Pacific yeah, absolutely. And we're, we're doing lots around that at the moment. It's really exciting time for the region. I think a lot of companies look at the US first from the UK. And I, I might flip over to you, Rose, because you are American and you are you set up your business in London. Uh, so it'd be really interesting to understand a bit more about those decisions and some of the technologies that you're seeing in your industry with the conversion of en entertainment industry and, and tech. Yes. Um, well, it wasn't anything... When I decided to start my company, which was in 2012, it was a very big decision on whether I stayed working um, in the corporate America structure or if I actually went out on my own. And that was a very difficult decision, but it was something that I was ready to do. Um, I had built my career working at the studio level um, in the U.S. and in publishing. And so when I when I had this idea, um, I was in, based in New York, and I also had a huge opportunity to go back to California to run um, the North American division for this company I was working for. And I decided not to and to, to start Screen Hits. And um, when it was, where do I start Screen Hits? Do I go to Silicon Valley where there's a wealth of, you know, investment? They are more free giving, I guess you can say. Um, I find that in the UK, um, when they invest, even if they're investing at the seed level, they expect the company to be almost at Series A, B level before they even invest. 200,000 pounds. When in the United States, a seed level, they can invest a million pounds and expect that valuation to be at 15 million with no pre-revenue. And they really bet on the teams and the idea, and then they support those companies to hit those numbers. I did not see that in the UK. So when I when I had this decision, it was like, okay, where do I go? But I ended up choosing the UK for a few reasons. One, um, what I do media, it wasn't as competitive. I thought that I would be seen more um, on the media tech side because there wasn't that many people knocking on the doors, pitching ideas every day. So I thought I would have a better opportunity. And two, um, it was kind of a selfish reason. I didn't want to have a plan B. And I think that a lot of people start companies and if it doesn't work, they just go back and get a job in corporate America because they have to pay the bills. So I knew that when it got hard, which inevitably it would have, um, I would probably have just went back to the studio world and got a job. And 
I'm happy I didn't go to LA because, you know, I was in the UK on an entrepreneur visa. I had started to build my company after six months. I really loved it. I was getting some momentum, raised a little bit of money, um, not enough, um, but a, a little bit. And I really wanted to stay. And it was that that threat of, oh, gosh, I can't get another job here in the UK. I have to make screen hits work. That actually is one of the driving forces to me pushing through those hard times. And then I'm um, your Go on. No, sorry. Go ahead, Rose. And then uh, your your second question on just some of the the innovation of tech that that I'm seeing in, in my space is, you know, as the industry is changing and people are leaving pay TV, you know, customers are really frustrated um, with paying these high bills for pay TV. Um, if you kind of go back to like the early 2000s, Blockbuster, who was like this global behemoth, they had everybody renting videos. They kind of took out all the small mom and pop shops, but then they started making a lot of money off of late fees, and people were paying more in late fees than they were even renting and it was a disaster but blockbuster didn't want to get rid of it because it was so much money making um, and that kind of gave way to netflix because they were there are no more late fees you want to rent videos you keep the video as long as you want then you send it back when you want another one and that's kind of what's happening right now with pay tv they've charged so much money for the satellite dish for the set top box and making you kind of buy bundles and people are like why am i paying 80 pounds to 100 pounds i don't even watch these channels i'm always on netflix i'm always on amazon i might keep it for the sports but uh, isn't tennis now on amazon i'm so confused so um <laughs> people are kind of like well, what do i do i don't want to get rid of sky because that's where everything's at but i don't really know where to go to get everything that i want and so screen hits is basically creating that but in the digital space and what we're seeing is you know how a lot of these are partners and the companies that are in the streaming um service are thinking okay you know, before we used to have all these different um, links and technology to our videos and to our metadata, and they're now creating universal links that work across all digital platforms from connected TVs to mobile phones to tablets and web OS. And that's really um, important because what it does is that that consumer, if they have a Netflix or an Amazon or a Disney or a Stars, they're able to view that content on any platform anywhere in the world without a satellite dish or um, set top box. So we're really happy to be a part of that um, progression. Yeah, I mean that that's super interesting, really disruptive uh, of that sec of the sector of entertainment. I mean that's a hard one to do, and we're, we're working at Tech Nation around uh, the legal sector at the moment, and we have a law tech panel trying to disrupt and bring in technology into the, the legal sector, which is a tough one as well. <laughs> yes. um, you can uh, imagine. Yeah, right. Um, Natalie, I'm going to come back to you. Um, and one of the questions that was put to us was um, how, how we found that tech has evolved to tackle critical problems in the last kind of five to ten years. And are we seeing that um, pace pick up as things change in the world and people are becoming more um, interested in, in critical things like climate change and, and other things like that? Yeah, Sam, I, I think that's definitely something that we're seeing in Asia and um, the whole sustainability debate. Um, is really at the heart of so many different business issues um, that I would say on any given day, uh, you know, I will get one or two requests for uh, who do you think are the most interesting UK tech startups in sustainability or green tech, how, however you want to define it. And that's a, a real opportunity. I mean, we've seen some really interesting companies come out of the UK, particularly on things like waste mapping. Um, and actually the opportunity to partner in Southeast Asia, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, if we get the right pilot and arrangement in place, it's a really good opportunity to deliver proof of concept and then, of course, take that back to investors. So, yeah, in terms of my areas to watch, um, I definitely think it's uh, green tech. And I do think the UK has got a really good offer on this. Um, but more often than not, maybe we don't have the right place um, to showcase this. And so that's why those international partners can make a real difference. Yeah, absolutely. And T, have you seen anything that you're, you're seeing coming out of all of the insights that you get with your role of any kind of really interesting new technologies that you, you didn't expect to be coming through right now? I think what we really see is, uh, that we find very interesting is the technology adoption. 
actually, right, in a lot of different areas. And there's so much discussion going on at the moment if it's here to stay or if it's going to bounce back after the COVID numbers, right? Let's take something that, you know, Rosia was touching earlier on about uh, Netflix, right? And you look at the stock market price of Disney has been fluctuating a lot. Same for Netflix. People are not sure if this extra spend that was pouring in to in-home entertainment is here to stay or when you can go to the pub on a Friday afternoon, you're going to shift your spend from a Disney subscription back to a couple of pints basically in the pub, right? And that's kind of some of the insights that we are looking at for our customers who do make those beers in the pub as they need to know, like if people are coming back or not. <laughs> and what you're seeing is actually here quite interestingly a hybrid model, as you would expect human behavior is complex. We have some people increasingly willing to travel and work remotely, right? Like stay away, um, live in Singapore or, you know, move to Indonesia and or live in Amalfi Coast maybe. And they want to still watch their Netflix and Disney, be fully connected through technology. So you see like an extreme level of adoption in that case. And they want to experience a different lifestyle. It's a small community though that our numbers show we are talking about 10% roughly who of the workforce who wants to behave that way and have more freedom and experimentation. No wonder they are usually people without families, earlier stages of life, etc. And then for the rest, we see a significantly hybrid use and almost using technology to be able to enable communications right, to be able to exist in a hybrid model. A really good example of that, Zoom calls may look effective and it brings us together, right? Some of you are not even in London, you know, you're connecting from Singapore and fantastic, we can all speak together. But if we want to do a whiteboard session, right, and we want to brainstorm on something, can we effectively do that on a Zoom call or do we want to still get into a room, right? And this is one of the really interesting areas. For example, there are whiteboarding technology businesses now emerging that you can plug it into your Zoom connection and then try to work that way. I think that's what I find most fascinating. The world is going to settle post-COVID in a new level of technology adoption that is going to be definitely higher than where we left it before COVID. But it's also not going to stay where it was a year ago because people still need the human connection. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm missing that quite a lot. And I'm just going to stick with you, T. And just going back on the back of that, do you have any concerns around particular types of tech and how they might be affecting society as they continue to grow and evolve and innovate? You know, so I'm, I'm thinking about biases around AI, and I know that you, you use a lot of that kind of system systems in your business. Yeah, I mean, look, when we think about the, you know, groundbreaking technological changes and their impact on the society. Um, there, there are two sides to that. One big impact is automation and the impact on employment, right? And we can fight that. We can, you know, argue with that. We can even try to limit that. You may know during the Gandhi times in India, they refused to use sewing machines and they was taking jobs away from tailors, right? Which was a huge economic livelihood. But you know what? Sewing machines won <laughs> in the end. So we all now use them. So in my view, obviously I'm massively biased as a technologist. I would say that you can't fight technological advancement because it makes life easier. People are going to adopt it and you can delay it. But, you know, sooner or later, it's just going to happen. The question is then how do we use it to service our needs? Because we still own these technologies. We make them work in a way that we want. And I think that it's going to be increasing the discussion. Furloughs were a very interesting experiment for UBI, right? If we come to a world where we actually can automate a lot of the jobs, and by the way, we are still many, many years away from that. If you think about it, even like flipping burgers in a fast food restaurant, which is not a hugely desirable job for anyone, it's still manual. We still couldn't build the robot to do that, right? So we're not quite there yet anyway, but we are getting closer to that. 
and we, as a society, we have to think about what does that mean from universal basic income perspective, like how can people reskill, focus on things that don't make money because they don't need to make money anymore, but instead our focus turns into self-realization, right? And that's a one big part of the discussion we are having in, definitely in the technology community. I think the other side, which I find quite interesting as a potential negative effect of technology, is promoting loneliness, right? and less human connection. And that can partly come from social media. We think that Snapchatting or posting TikTok videos is interaction, but is it really, right? Are you really getting the connection and oxytocin that you need, or is it just dopamine, basically, you are getting constantly? And I think those are the key two areas to think about, like, is the technology we are building, Zoom calls, social media posts, making us increasingly a lonelier and lonelier society? And if it is, like, what is the answer to that? Yeah, the effects on mental health and other things when you've not got that physical connection with others. And Rose, how about you with the, on the technology side too? Is there any concerns that you see coming out or anything that's on your mind around this? I mean, I, I, do, I, I do see that there's going to be an... Can you hear me? I, I hear a bit of feedback. Okay, sorry. I do feel that there are issues, and I think what Tutche said, which was, you know, the loneliness on the, you know, impact. You know, I have two very young daughters. My six-year-old is actually able to navigate very easily through the, the web. What is she finding on there? I can't police her 24-7. You know, you know, it starts to teach and educate people things, and there is no policing on the internet because anybody can put anything they want. Anybody can put any video. They can give any sort of perspective, and there is a danger there. Um, and especially for children. But um, the House of Lords Committee, um, the government is really looking at ways to try to protect children. You know, with screen hits, um, you know, one of the issues that we found around technology is that even if you have one streaming service for your children, like Disney, for example, you leave your kids on, the, you know, the, the child Disney, but what if they just go into their remote control and they click on Amazon and now they're watching, you know, Godfather of Harlem and watching Forrest Whitaker doing bad things. It's like, <laughs> oh my God, you know, and you realize that, you know, it needs to be more simple, you know, so we created this child pen, which actually blocks any sort of, you know, adult content above the age of 13 across all the streaming platforms. Um, so at least as a parent, you know, okay, my child can use this, they can, they can stream all the platforms that we have, and you know, they're not going to be able to access, you know, like El Chapo or something. So uh, this is important. So I think it's, you know, looking at, you know, the, the negative sides of technology, and then finding a way to make them positive. You know, a lot of people say, oh, people are going to lose jobs, but it's on the contrary. I think that we will just start to create more things in a faster way, which will generate more revenue, and people will have better lives, because if you have someone doing something that was maybe done by a human before, but then you can have the humans go into more of a managerial um, um, position and, and managing that, and so the workforce becomes more of robotic or more AI, um, and, and that, that does have to ha happen. When you look at the food shortages in the world, when you look at education shortages in the world because there's not enough good teachers, you know, how do you maintain people still becoming educated if you don't have the right teachers to help do it? But technology can actually help solve some of these problems, and it's just working how we live side by side, and that, that will happen. And that that's all, you know, a lot of revolution, like industrial revolution and other things that kind of we have to start to try and keep up with that. And one of the things that I often think about is that we're in technology and we understand technology, but there's a lot of people who don't and a lot of parents who don't understand how to protect their children online. And uh, there's a fantastic organisation in the UK called Tech Mums where they um, upskill when uh, mums to make sure that they can protect their children understand how to put these privacy things on youtube and other things as uh, so i think well there's this um there's this really interesting i don't have a teenage daughter yet thank god but um the, there's, there's there's a technology out there where parents are able to you know they're able to basically mirror their child's phone so they're yeah. able to see what their children are looking at without the child knowing and they're able to see what their message is which can help you. And so this one mother had saw her daughter was looking up, you know, how to live off a 500 uh, calorie a day diet. And the mother completely 
freaked out, but she used this technology to to get, to help her daughter get some help to understand that without having to say, I've been looking at your phone, but it helps us to become better parents and to really understand the things that children don't want to say to their mom or dad through technology. But yes, you're right. It's about helping people become more aware of this stuff. And there's there is a problem that people are not getting this amazing information on technology because VCs are not investing in female companies. <laughs> uh, let's stick with that, Rose, because I was reading a start, uh, which I shouldn't be shocked by adopt, where 0.02% of all investment over the last 10 years in the UK went to black female founders, which is horrifying. Um, and, you know, you've raised a lot of funding and been super successful. Have you got any tips for other women who are in your position who are trying to raise funding, trying to start their tech company, trying to be brave like you were and kind of give up their day job and take that security away? Well, first of all, I should have raised 50 million by now. So I'll settle for <laughs> 6 million. But if I was a man, I would have raised 50 to 100 million and my company would be so much farther along. Um, it's it's not great, okay? So there's, there's two ways to look at it. You know, there are some people that are out there um, using their influence to try to change things on a legal level, because sometimes you just have to go to a legal level. I mean, people are human beings and the VC companies are run by human beings and they have biases, whether they're unconscious biases or they are whatever, but they, they just think I'm probably going to get a better return on my investment if I go with this person, because it'll be easier for me to find follow on investment because more people will invest with him than to invest with her, whatever. Um, and so it's really difficult, but there is a positive side to not getting investment because nine times out of 10, if not 10 times out of 10, a woman that does create a business and it does happen to get successful because of the hard work she's done. She's found the revenue instead of the investment. She's built a great product. She's found the customers on her own without having to have that investment. When it's finally at a 10 million pound company a year in revenue, somebody will come along and say, we want to invest 20 million to get you to the next level. And then they will say, you've taken the company as far as you can. It's time for you to move over so we can put a white male in that position to continue to run it. So without having VC investment, that will never happen to you, okay? And there are ways to get investment through crowdfunding, you know, making connections with angel investors, getting to know them on a personal level, getting them to meet your team, you know, finding um, a business that you can sell unit to unit. And it's not just black females, it's it's even white males and white women and all types of people that have to take investment from somebody else. You lose a bit of, of your company um, and, 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 and your vision. And, you know, unlike Mark Zuckerberg, who was quite clever to never be diluted more than 51%, a lot of people are not in that position to, to maintain that. And, you know, the, the constant pressure from the the investors and you have to, where's your exit? You have to hit this. It doesn't allow you to grow your company in a, a safe and natural way. You know, my father always said, you need 10 years to build a, a legacy, to build a company that lasts. Yeah, you can maybe, you know, build a company to flip in 14, 18 months, but that company will most likely die under the banner of somebody else. So give yourself 10 years and learn to sell units, learn to sell your product. Um, this is the most important thing. So I think we as women, should really not see if I want to have a successful company, I need to have VC investment. We need to really look at it as, okay, this is going to be a really hard five years, six years, but I believe in this and I'm going to make it happen and I'm going to make a lot of people rich because of it. Yeah, so You just have to maintain that confidence, um, but it is hard. It's so hard and it's, um, there's no, there's no doubt about it. People go in debt, people burn out their, um, you know, credit cards. They do what they need to do. But if you 100% believe in your company, then it will it will find its way. You just have to do the the hard work, but it happens. Yeah, and and T, what's your view on this? Because you've raised funding as well, right? We did, we did. I mean, I completely agree with Rose. It's not for every company, right? And you should make the choices for your business. And I think it's a mistake to jump in and assume that you have to raise money. And if you don't, you shouldn't, right? And in, in maintaining the control longer absolutely helps in in a lot of ways. However, there are some businesses that's not possible. And in those cases, I think it's super important that it doesn't matter if it's like female or male leader, because otherwise hard, high capex and deep tech businesses would never come from women because you can't get those off the ground without significant capital. Street business is definitely in that category. We raised more than $80 million to date in six years. Um, it's a 200 people company now across offices in like four or five different countries. 
and our ML team only is 40 people right now. That, that's an expensive workforce that you have to support and your revenues is simply just not going to pay for that, right? For a while at least, because we have to do R&D. Now, in, in, in those situations, if that's what you want to build, you shouldn't be disheartened because of your color, gender, background. So for everyone who hasn't met me yet, who will be maybe listening to this conversation, I grew up in Turkey. I did a political science degree as an undergrad. I had nothing to do with technology until much later age in, in, in life. And when I came into this, of course, you get a lot of stereotypes of a, like a non-computer science a uh, woman with a funny accent coming from like a completely different world is saying that she's going to build one of the top world's five technology companies, right? And yes, you have to work harder than some of your colleagues who would actually be a bit more taken for granted to be in that position. My biggest tip to everyone is that pick your battles. I usually ask my team when they get like really frustrated because of some, you know, discrimination or, or diversity related issues is do you want to pick up a fight or do you want to win? Mm -hmm. And sometimes they don't necessarily go together and it's absolutely OK. There are times you just want to pick up the fight and that's OK too. like say that acknowledge that you're not doing that to win. It's a fight that really matters to you and you want to you want to fight that fight. But if you do that every day, you are not going to win because yeah, you won't yeah. have the time left to be able to get ahead, right? So my philosophy has been that work with people who appreciate you rather than worrying and you know complaining about the ones who don't. Your biggest punishment is not giving them the right to work with you. They don't get to invest in you. What yeah. could be a bigger punishment than that, really? <laughs> Distance yourself from negativity, walk away. Once in a while, if it really annoys you or if it's like the behavior is illegal and you really want to make a point, fine, do that, right? But most of the time I put my energy and focus on, OK, this is a party I can't work with. They're just not going to respect what I'm bringing to the table. So I'm just going to move away from this. And I think there are a lot of amazing VCs now based in Europe. Um, either in London or like, you know, in some of the other locations, this is possible to do, right? We raised $80 million from the top tier investors like Atomico, Lake Star, Local Globe, who are now our shareholders, who are absolutely what I call gender neutral. We don't want affirmative action either. I yeah, think we yeah. just want a fair game, right? Yeah, so when people look at you, they are seeing an entrepreneur. They are not seeing a woman or man. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, completely. Completely agree and I think one of the things that I mean I lived in Silicon Valley for eight years and it's not always the best way it's fast and furious and actually it's a graveyard for startups it's not you know you know we hear about the great ones but there's, there's a lot of that don't work and fail and that's not good for a lot of people people, families and others. Uh, and I think that the network is one of the things that I've realised. I, I came from a working class background in Manchester in, in a very, you know, in, in the north of England and I moved to Silicon Valley and then all of a sudden had this huge network and I came back to the UK to share that network. And that's something that Natalie and I are working on across Asia to, you know, open that, that, that access to other people. And Natalie, I'll come to you because, you know, working in, in government and, you know, working in your position now across technology, across Asia, it'd be really interesting how, how you think you could tackle some of some of those things for founders. Thanks, Sam. I mean, look, first of all, I should say like what amazing stories both Rose and Torchy have. I mean, that's exactly what you want the UK to be, right? You know, we want exciting tech companies who are pushing the barriers to feel that they've got a supportive ecosystem and can have challenging conversations, right? Exactly as you've suggested. Um, I think for, you know, from a government point of view, when it comes to technology, there are so many different issues to think about now. And I think Tochi touched on it in terms of thinking about the technology itself and then the application. So we're really lucky in the UK. We have four of the top 10 universities in the world. You know, there is a hell of a lot of talent and we're very, very proud of that. But it's in the application that you get some of the challenges. So sort of touching on some of the earlier points that were made, you know, 
really understanding what the regulatory environment is that you're operating in, the legal environment, you know, all the debates around data before you even interact with the family stuff, which Rose was talking about so passionately, which is so important. Actually, there's, you know, there's a step in between where the debate between the government and the tech sector is increasingly important because we all have to take responsibility about application, right? You throw something out there and it can be used in so many different ways. And the same is true when you look at the gender debate, right, or the diversity debate more broadly in UK technology. I think we have a responsibility to make sure that anyone who wants to have a go at starting uh, something exciting in the UK can do that. And the point is, there's lots of different ways to do that. That's what we've heard today. We've heard very different stories, but both very passionate and doing something that's changing the UK for the better. So how do we support more of those stories in a relatively neutral way? Right. I think that's a very good point. What everyone wants is a level playing field. Now, there's obviously a lot going on in the UK government system at the moment to look at these kinds of issues. So the House of Lords was mentioned already in terms of some of the reviews that have been done there. The Treasury have done a number of reviews to increase tra transparency, particularly on um, uh, how VC fund um, funding is not just uh, invested, but actually how it's sourced to begin with. And I think what we can do as a tech community is support and encourage all of those kinds of initiatives, because more transparency is only going to make the situation better and fairer. And of course, you know, you hats off to accelerate her. The other thing that we can do, of course, is shine a spotlight on companies like this to show, you know, this is what is possible, because I'm sure we all know from our own careers, right? You look up and you look around you and you think that's what I'd like to do. And so it's really important for everyone coming behind Rose and Chuchi that they can see that this is possible for them and it can be done in a fair and transparent way. So I think that's what we're trying to do across the UK government at the moment. And one of the joys of being in Asia is watching how other countries are trying to tackle all these problems because it's not just us right everyone is trying to tackle this and what are the lessons that we can learn and I've definitely noticed in the three years that I've been doing this job I'm coming across more and more female-led um, companies across Asia Pacific and female-led uh, it's, it's not just about the CEO and the top team jobs, right? Actually, you've got to look at who are the data scientists, um, who, who are the behind the scenes jobs that maybe don't get all the, um, all the attention, uh, but actually that's the heart and soul of any company. And what you're seeing is more diverse companies here who are attracting more investment, if that's you know, one of your measures, but you know, definitely take the point earlier, it's not the only measure. So what we have to keep doing is looking up and around and making sure that the UK is the very, very best for attracting talent, retaining talent, retaining talent, and then providing a fair um, and level playing field. So we're trying hard, but there's always more that we can do. Absolutely. I think that's, uh, we're running up on time now. So I feel like that's a pretty good wrap up for us, Natalie. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> Amanda, I did just want to add that, you know, if I can just add really quickly, you know, there are a lot of statistics that are, are out there and that, that are going around. And when a child reads, for example, only less than 0.3% of black females, for example, get VC funding, it's an immediate, like, why should I start? Why should I try? And, you know, it's a very dangerous number because it's, um, it sets propaganda on a process to say, well, it doesn't matter. Even if you try, you're not gonna get it. And I think it's really important that people still go out and try to do what they need to do and put everything behind it because there are companies like Macro, which is um, started by Charles C. King that invests in um, you know, um, companies that are underrepresented, et cetera, that they have a chance. But the worst thing you could do is to have somebody start a journey thinking they have no chance. So I think yeah. it's very important, no matter what, even if a company needs 80 million to 100 million to become a Google, you can still get that eventually through other ways. And it's very important. And I think these numbers have to stop being shared and it needs to be more understanding why and what people can do to find alternative funding uh, methods or to increase their revenues. It's very yeah, important. No, absolutely. I think that's really important. And, you know, we're part of the narrative of that. And I think that's something that we need to think about um, on a day to day basis, 100 percent Rose. And Tushi, did you have anything that you wanted to add in? I think it was a fantastic wrap up. I think on the same page, what I would always uh, recommend to anyone I'm mentoring that you are the 1%. Why are you worrying right. about the stats? Go for it, right? <laughs> there is 1% who's gonna win this, it's you. 
So yeah. you might as well go give it a go and try. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And I think on that, I will say thank you to all three of you. That was really interesting. I think we could have talked a lot more, uh, but just to respect your time in this heat uh, today. Thank you so much for joining us. And it was really nice to meet you all. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. So bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.